Good morning, everyone. And good evening for some. As most people will be more interested in uh, the presentation that will follow shortly, I will start the introduction a bit, uh, a bit earlier, so leaving more time for, for discussion. So a very warm welcome to, to all of you to these Berlin Demography Days. The ones of you that have been so fortunate to join us yesterday know that we already had some great sessions. Yesterday we focused on democracy, demography and the welfare state. And the day before we uh, discussed the uh, retiring baby boomers in, uh, in Europe and mainly in Germany. So now it's up to us to carry on uh, this uh, torch of knowledge in the third chapter of the Berlin Demography Days. So first, let me introduce myself. Today, I'm representing the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, the IUSSP, which is the World Association of Population Scientists. And we are there to promote the study of population science, which involves many disciplines and to encourage interaction um, among researchers in, in population across the globe. And of course, if you're not a member, you should definitely consider to join us. Uh, the IUSSP is very proud to join this great initiative organized by our good friends of Population Europe, and especially I'd like to thank already Andreas Edel and his team and the other sponsors of these uh, events uh, and for inviting us to, to join and to organize also this today's uh, sessions. Today's program uh, puts the spot on uh, data, which, as you know, is the lifeblood of any science, including population science. And data, data science, innovative approaches to data are a priority, of course, for the IUSSP, where we have had major activities the last years on data, demography, uh, demography and the data revolution, uh, promoting data for development and the use of data for all uh, practitioners. Uh, and of course, we have many scientific panels in the IUSSP focusing on data, and one of them is the, the scientific panel on digital demography, and I'm glad that uh, people from uh, that uh, network are here today as well. So today's topic is a, is a very good fit with the work at IUSSP, and I'm glad uh, again to see that uh, several colleagues of IUSSP will join today. Uh, we are looking forward to, of course, great sessions, and it's now high time to, to kick off and start. And with our first presentation, it will uh, be on population aging in an unconventional demographic regime. And it's by Professor James K.S. James is director and senior professor at the International Institute for Population Science in Mumbai, which is a powerhouse and a leading population center in the region and beyond. And, James, by the way, is also joining me in the steering committee for the International Population Conference of the IUSSP, which was supposed to take place in, in Hyderabad, will be in Hyderabad for a part, but will be mainly virtual. James, my good friend, the floor is yours and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nico. And let me also express my deep sense of gratitude to all the organizations of the population Europe and the particularly Dr. Andres and Dr. Nico for inviting me to be part of this exciting event. So I, I was looking into the program, I was really amazed how interestingly or how beautifully it is being organized. And in a period we all meet only virtually, we, do, we are not in a position to meet physically and exchange ideas. But I think this provides really an immense opportunity all of us to have some shared views on particularly today on the issues of data, which I will also be sharing some of the insights on the data from India. And also I will be primarily speaking today something on the issue of aging in this country, which is premature perhaps because India is too early at stage for the aged, but at the same time, I think it is important to really start looking into the future aspects of aging in this country. So let me start sharing my slides and then uh, go ahead without wasting much of time because the time I understand it's, it's also short. So I will primarily focus on this 
uh, areas today because you know India, as all of you perhaps know, that it is on a rapid course of demographic transition in recent decades. So India's demographic change at the same time is considered to be a bit unconventional. So I will come back to that. What does that I mean by this unconventional nature of the demographic transition? But the nature of the demographic transition also creates a certain implications for the elderly in this country and particularly for their well being, which I will focus towards the end. But let me tell you that this is a sort of a very broad brush which I am doing. I am only looking at two or three major spheres where implications I will be looking at, not any deep analysis, but only just giving a broad idea because it's a presentation on India. I thought, you know, it's better to give a larger views rather than a specific uh, areas or specific work which I am doing on the living arrangement. That is not my purpose here, but my purpose is quite broad in this uh, paper today. So the content of the presentation will be as follows. First, I will start with the demographic transition and age structure change in India. And I will also explain why, what, what do I mean by unconventional nature of the demographic change in India. And then I will look at the implications at a very broad level. I will look at two implications primarily, one on economic implications, not all economic implications, only one part of the economic implications, what will have its impact. And also maybe something on the family and well-being because family is supposed to be the cornerstone of, stone of India's aged in, in currently. So I will look at and perhaps end with some messages on that. So let me come to the part which is the India's demographic changes. I don't think that I need to explain uh, this graph to all of you because as I mentioned to you, India at this time, 2020, 2021 we are, 2020 according to the UN projection, India is already at the replacement level of 2.1 and it has been declining quite fast for the last few decades, at least last two decades, the India's fertility transition. So that way the, the growth rate of population is also has been declined substantially over the last decade or two. And if you imagine that in the future, the fertility remains almost at a low level and the population growth also will be achieving a plateau maybe by 2050 or 60. That is what uh, we know from the UN population projection. But let us come to India specific areas because you know, if you know, India is also a country with large diversity. If you really look at the total fertility rate, we would see that majority of the states has achieved replacement level fertility. But at the same time, we also have certain location where actually the fertility level is relatively high. So this is a sort of a drastically diverse country which we are speaking. So what, what, does, what does I mean by, uh, what do I mean by the unconventional nature of the demographic transition? So you know, if you look at the conventional wisdom, we would expect that India's fertility transition should have been with a socioeconomic change, if not socioeconomic change, at least some characteristics of female education is supposed to be critical and reduction in infant mortality rates is another important marker for any fertility transition we look forward. So what does it happen? So just looking at one or two figures. So if you really look at the figures on the fertility transition across states in India, among illiterate women in this country, because you know, if you really know, uh, if you really want to understand what is really happening, in majority of the states in the country, the adult population constitute almost, you can say 40 to 60% of the adult population is illiterate. So we are really speaking about a huge number of adult illiteracy in this country because of in the past, the literacy level has been relatively very poor. So naturally all of them didn't get educated during that 40 years or 30 years back. So naturally all of them are right now in the reproductive or adult age group. So you, at the same time, you would see a large majority of these states, the illiterate fertility is much below replacement. And there are states which is illiterate fertility is above replacement. They are actually even literate fertility is uh, above replacement. So to give an example, this is what I was still, I, I thought, you know, I can give, give examples from two states, which you would get an idea, the contrast which is happening. This is a state 
in the southern part of the country where you would see in most areas, whether you are illiterate, whether it was educated, everything, you know, the fertility level is below replacement level because I took, took two states where the literacy level as well as the religious composition of, of the population is almost distributed, if not equally, at least substantial proportion of the religious population is also available in these states. That is why I have taken. But we have another extreme. We also see that even among the literate people, even with an education more than 12 years, even the replacement level fertility is not achieved in some parts of the country in another state. But there is obviously variation between religious group, between uh, educational groups in that, that particular state. But at the same time, you would see everything is above replacement level fertility. So these kinds of paradox you see in different phenomena. If you really look at the relationship between fertility and even infant mortality rate, we would again see this. You, you can see some of the states where even below replacement level fertility is achieved almost 1.9, but the infant mortality rate is almost one among the highest in this country. So these kinds of varied contrast you see in the pattern of fertility transition in India, which I considered or I think it is a bit unconventional nature of the fertility transition in this country. So what does it mean? It, it means that India is having sort of a very highest heterogeneity in terms of fertility. But the heterogeneity we see is primarily across region, not actually across socioeconomic group. But wherever, which are the regions which are able to achieve a low fertility, irrespective of the characteristics of the, the population there, the characteristics of the women there, you could actually achieve replacement level fertility. But there are other parts you would see very high fertility as well. So this is sort of a diversity which we see in this country. So I should just give an example if you, we can, we can estimate actually fertility level from the census population indirectly. And if you estimate, you would see enormous variation because state itself is a very huge unit in this country because there are only around 30 states, but we hope for one point, 3 billion population. So naturally, district itself is uh, constitute around 2 to 3 million population. So each of these districts also, you can see even less than 1.5 districts are substantial around 5. Now it has, in 2020, it will be around 15%. And in more than 3 also, there were 40% in 2011 census, but 21 census, we could not really start because of the COVID, but otherwise that was the picture which we are getting. What is analysis? So analysis, so even there is no convergence which is happening, even with the rapid fertility transition, even with which we see that the some of the states has achieved replacement level fertility even a decade back, et cetera, but you don't really see that much of a convergence because none of this coefficient was significant. So it means that actually those states where fertility transition, fertility even low were actually there is a decline is still happening. So we don't know what would be the lowest rate which they, they are going to achieve in the future. So I would not actually take a uh, uh, look at the findings from that. I will straight away go to the implications of the fertility transition, especially for the aged in this country. So because I have to also give some explanation why am I concerned with aged in this country? Because you know India is supposed to be a country now with demographic dividend and you know most of the uh, scholars in this country as well as outside are speaking about India's potential benefit because of the demographic dividend with bulging age population but adult population but we can also see that you know India's age is also rapidly increasing particularly from you can say from 2020 onwards for the next few decades there's a rapid rise in the proportion of elderly in this country so that is very certain, which will have a direct implications for the elderly. So that's why it is so important really to look at what would be the implications of this a peculiar nature of demographic changes on the elderly in this country. And why the second why we are concerned is also that if you really look at the time which we have taken for the proportion of population, proportion of aged population, has to increase from 7% to 14% in different countries to give some cite some examples. You can see the variations because you know in some countries it took 110 years to 80 years in many of the European countries, but in India or China, it is taking 25 
power to in india it is 20 years within 20 years it is going to double from 7% which is 65 plus population currently is something around 7% or little over that to something around 14% within next 20 years so that is the rapidity in with the changes we anticipate in the coming decades so what does it imply for the aged population that is what uh, has been the concern if you really want to understand that we also need to look at what is the characteristics of the aged in this country currently because i will just quickly go through it because one way i can say okay majority of the aged are illiterate in this country as i told you about adult population it is also true and social security are negligible so how do they survive in india because the nature of the work is more in the informal sector most of them continues to work there is no retirement age for any of the elderly in this country less than 10 percent only work in the formal sector so naturally they were continues to work and many of them earn their living from the work or they have been supported by the family that is the family is the most important source of support and economic support in this family and as you know co-residence is the most common form of the living arrangement in this country so what are we worried about then if family is the very strong cornerstone of the care and support or the economic uh, well-being of this elderly are we need to worry much about it we are worried because if you really look at because of late we had a survey which is called longitudinal aging study of india which is which we can say almost the the one of the largest longitudinal studies or hrs family part of the hrs family studies in this country so which is around 70000 the elderly older adults from 45 plus are being followed will be followed for every two years so this is the first wave of the result is just out a month back and the data is also now available so if you really look at what does it really signifies it it really signifies that in the past if you really look at in this country the households with an elderly was always been economically better off compared to a non-elderly households typically because what i have told before the characteristics of the elderly has been different because many of them have been working and contributing naturally because they have been working and contributing so their contribution has been significant but if you look at the last the latest study you would see suddenly the things are altering so if you really look at households with an elderly household without and elderly now suddenly you would see that the sorry the first part is the elderly household is non not non elderly uh it's, it's been slightly it's wrong this is completely for the elderly and this is for the non elderly and you would see that now households with non elderly is becoming better off in terms of their economic standing whether it in terms of their consumption pattern, whether it is there in terms of the per capita income, which is estimated in the last study, which is compared to many other studies in the past. In the past, all other studies, whether it is UNFPA study on aging, whether it is different rounds of NSSO survey, which has very clearly told that is the other way. So suddenly we see a change because of various reasons, the rapid aging and you know the economic changes, which is happening, rapid economic changes in, in India, which is happening actually pushing away the elderly from the non-traditional the traditional work and you know they are not able to cope up with the, the the current the modern work so naturally they are not able to get adequate employment perhaps and also their contribution within the family is supposed to be dwindling what is what would be its impact if that is really happening in this country such a rapid changes is happening particularly when a situation we know that at least for the next 20 to 30 or 40 years the coming generation of elderly also will be illiterate will be will be lack with adequate skills so you would also see, see if you look at the lassi data a sudden shift in the population which is not co-residing with the children otherwise as i as i told you the co-residing with the children has been sort of a norm in this country except maybe perhaps very young uh, early old age people between 60 to 70 etc otherwise it has been very known but we will see sudden shift in this pattern as well so in the means that in the future actually if you really want to project because that was what we were working on it actually how do we really based on this characteristic how, how can we project the co-residence pattern in this country in the future so that is what we see if you really look at the other characteristics like what is really happening the economic front 
you would also see a drastic changes which is happening at the family level. So what does it really indicate? Conclude finally, because I'm just running short of my time, so I will finally conclude. It means that, you know, earlier family has been the cornerstone of the elderly in this country, which is supposed to be the golden cage for the elderly, because most of the elderly has been supported by the family, because social security measures has been negligent, negligent in this country, and so naturally the support has to come from family. But things are rapidly changing in this country. There is the data now shows that the, there's a change the, in the households where the elderly are living compared to non-elderly households. So naturally, household which has been, you can say, non-nuclear households is going to be nuclear because economic of lack of economic contribution also perhaps can lead to a disintegration of the family system as well. So all those things will have a direct impact on the elderly. So the observation currently that India has one of the lowest uh, living alone among across the countries, but that is going to change. That will have a direct impact on all aspects of elderly. So how do you really understand the future projection? It was actually a major challenge as a demographer. That is what we were trying to work on. I'm not showing that part of the presentation. It's only giving you a broad brush on what's really happening. Thank you so much. Okay. Can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, James, for a very uh, exciting presentation and showing the huge heterogeneity and, and the challenges uh, for, for India. Unfortunately, uh, because of the way this, this seminar is organized, we do not have a lot of time for discussion. Uh, there were no questions in the Q&A. I think people are just trying to, to digest all the information, the rich information. Only this to say is it demonstrates again that India is a fascinating country to, uh, to study and also to, uh, to go to. So that's why we're very happy that we will have our, our conference partly hybrid, partly virtual on India and India, and we will hear more about it then. Thank you very much. I, there, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I think also in view of the time, I will uh, hand over to Andreas Edel for the next session, okay? Thank you very much, James, for your presentation. It was really very, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.